Frame rate looks good. <coughs> Sorting out my cabling. Wait a sec. Oh, consistent frame rate. Good stuff. So much better than Wednesday. Let me just check everything else. Set up my eyes. Bear with me, folks. Um, <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. I'm going to need to move these slightly. Otherwise, you won't do it. See that we're doing. It's good. sure how many of you are going to be around today not my normal spot obviously um, this normally occurs on a Wednesday but we be having some issues on Wednesday which means that I couldn't get the stream going it was dropping out all the time and then after restarting modems networks laptops you name it um i couldn't get back up on the internet until about an hour and a half later so stream got cancelled To set up, gonna need that in a bit. I wonder if that's gonna be any help. Let me just check. <clears throat> Let me just get a few um, <clears throat> editor windows open. Just going to need these in a bit. I need that one. I'm just sorting out my window, so bear with me, folks. I know the people are arriving. I'm not sure how many people are going to be joining us this evening, but I will continue ahead anyhow, even if there's a small number of people. So I do have stuff to share. Um, have I got this open? Uh, some barren look. Yes, we need that. Where's the other window? Uh, D, here we go. Hi, European Eduardo. <clears throat> um, what happened to my motor stuff? Uh, I don't know. Can you be more specific? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Strange. Why, do, why doesn't this editor update? Let me just check. I'm mounting the right um, devices here. It might be. But it's not up. 
Oh yes, so it's not right. Okay. So uh, what happens if I do this? Definitely up now, but I still can't see it. Why doesn't Sublime text folder views update when it changes? Barely still I'm sure. Let me just open another one. Open. Oh, wait a minute. It's got more than one. Um, Open file. Let's try that. Uh, code. It manually opens it, but it won't open it in the folder. Um, Eduardo. Are you talking about PMODs, maybe? Is that um, Eduardo in Austria? Do you know? Let me know, Eduardo, which one you are, because I'm guessing. At the moment, also versus the motor stuff. I mean, I do lots of different motor stuff, so I, I I do need you to be a bit more specific. I'm wondering if if you're the Eduardo that I think you are, then you might be talking about um, P mod based boards and such. Hey, hi Ed. Just remembered. Well, normally I stream on uh, Wednesday anyhow. It's odd for me to be streaming on the Friday. It's just I had real problems on Wednesday with uh, with my internet pipes. It just was not playing. They were blockhead, then unblockhead, and then blockhead, then unblockhead. And it just, it was just hugely frustrating on Wednesday. So in the end, I had to give in. It did write itself, but that was like half past nine by the time that happened. And that's just like too late. Um, can I have an audio check as well, please? Anyone? Uh, just want to make sure that A, I've got audio coming through, and B, that I don't have double audio like I did two weeks ago. <clears throat> That'd be really cool if you could let me know. Anyone? Uh, for those that aren't yet following, I, I know I often talk about you should subscribe. Forget the subscription thing. That's not what I really meant. What I meant is you should follow me. If I get a certain number of followers, they automatically keep my streams. I do record them locally anyhow. Uh, and then I'm pushing them up on YouTube at the moment. Uh, the archives of each one. It would be great if this just kept these streams. It seems to break them up sometimes as well. There's disruption in the middle. Uh, and I'm still getting to grips with how Twitch's um, creative software works. It's not straightforward, not by any measure. No problem, Ed. Um, so yeah, we had fun this week, um, that messed with our normal Wednesday schedule for the stream, but, uh, I figured I'd just do it tonight. I mean, I've done Friday streams before anyhow. It's not always the best night to do it. I mean, I quite like it, but it's not always good for other people because there can be quite a lot going on, uh, Friday night wise. Um, I am working on some P mods that have motor control on them, Eduardo. Eduardo, if that's what you're referring to. I will definitely do a. Um, I've got a couple of mix mod designs that are underway. Um, and I have an interesting little. Uh, 
project. Uh, and I'll use that to test the software features of Alloy actually. So I think it's a good candidate for <clears throat> perhaps showing how that works. I won't be doing that today, but um, when we get the bits and bobs running as they should, it, w it should prove um, an interesting basis on which to show some examples. <clears throat> I've literally just eaten as well because our food arrived late tonight. It's all been a bit of a rush today. Um, anyone not in the UK, um, our weather has gone south the last couple of days. Uh, we're pro into proper autumn now by the looks of it. Which is a shame. I was kind of enjoying the nice Indian summer we were having. But hey ho, we're probably all going to be locked down anyhow, uh, the way it's going. So, um, what are we going to cover tonight? Let me bring my notes up actually, I've already lost those. Just, I've got a few things here. So, first thing I wanted to talk about was the board. Um, if you remember, uh, now it's got icicle on the front of it for those of you that are not familiar with the story let me see if i can there we go a bit of focus never hurts so that's the alloy board i know it says icicle on it this is an earlier revision we ordered these boards um before we changed the name uh, if you want to hear about that go go back and see some of the previous streams but icicle name is used on another FPGA board, so we couldn't use it, which is why we changed the name. It's now called Alloy. And we call it an Alloy because it's a kind of fusion of different pieces uh, of kind of Om Neumann and logic, as well as the software that combines those two. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on, I was waiting for the components for this to arrive last time we spoke, which was not the Wednesday just gone, it was actually the Wednesday before, so nearly 10 days ago. I had most of the things, but I didn't have um, all of the uh, components I needed. I was missing a couple of passives. <sighs> and as typical, um, whenever you do these things, you find some issues. Um, so when I started putting the pieces on there, uh, after the reflow, which I did in my oven, uh, I should have done it on the hot plate. You should know this by now. But I've, I've messed up on some of the pads. I think I'm using the wrong... Um, pads for caps again and some of the resistors I've got a smaller set that I use for manufacturing I think I've accidentally used a larger set that makes it more difficult so quite often when you reflow them in the oven what you get is some tombstoning so I had maybe four tombstone caps which is rather annoying um, I had a couple of um, couple of blobs as well on the um, ESP hyphen S2 uh, two pin shorts one on the mode pin and one on one of the analog pins um, I fixed the mode pin I haven't fixed the analog one yet bit of flux and some uh, some of this stuff is always good some braid use a lot of this great for removing come on gonna have to use the trick Ed's trick trouble is it's really difficult to see when the piece of papers there are so if you ever use this solder braid uh, come on be a lock there we go 
Right, it really doesn't like this. There you go. It's basically like matted, fine solder. Um, fine solder threads matted together and what you want to do is use this in a lot of flux and then very carefully heat it up using a nice pointy tip or something similar next to the uh, offending pins uh, and even on something like this which is a QFN uh, you can suck up some of the excess and unsolder the two pins that may be soldered together it does work is good but I had to do it with the mode one because what it was doing is pulling the mode pin down well no it wasn't pulling the mode pin down I thought it was pulling the mode pin down it was actually doing something else it was tying it to a pin um, oh, where did I put that? so I had lots of fun with that um, and straight away afterwards uh, one of the first things you normally do when you bring up a board is you test the voltages and you look for shorts so you test the 5 volt i.e. USB B USB and you um, see if it's a short or a very low impedance so use continuity or, or, or you actually measure the impedance just using a, a multimeter or something and unfortunately the free volt free line was a short which I hate because that normally means uh, what is typical I mean it can be a component that's actually got a fault but normally what it is is you have a lot of things connected between free volt free and ground the biggest offenders are the decoupling caps because obviously you get a lot of those so it's always a nightmare when you see that short on the free volt free you think oh, there's a short under one of the caps or something and I had a good look on the board and I found one that hadn't reflow properly on right on the end and um, I reflowed that with the uh, heat pencil I don't know if you've ever seen one of these these are really useful but uh great for touching up and mending things and the screws loose on that so um, after doing that the short went which was great brilliant because I hate it when that happens <coughs> normally when that happens when you've got a short and free volt free and it's under a decoupling caps you, you know often it's not visible so you have to you end up having to take them all off one by one until you find the offending one and of course normally it's like the last or second to last one that you lift for your repair it's a, it's a horrible job but it kind of comes with prototype but luckily in this case they're all good it was just one that hadn't reflowed properly and there was some just loose flux and solder balls as soon as i reflowed it bingo uh the short was gone which is really nice very pleasing so then I had my voltage supplies so all the voltage supplies were good the VUSB 3 volt 3 1 volt 2 uh, and not only that you know the LED came on very important uh, so just to show you there yeah, she blows let's see if we can get a focus Ta -da. Uh, and that green is a good sign, status wise. Oh, we've lost, we've lost our focus again. You're trying to focus on me. Come on. You can do it. Ta-da! Anyhow, so there is a couple of issues, um, as well as the solder blob, um, the FPGA. Oh, 
you do it again. So that's the one furthest from the um, USB. That's this one. On the side nearest ESP32, uh, on some of the interfacing pins, it hasn't reflowed underneath. Both of these are QFM packages, by the way. Um, and my pads that I designed for the uh, QFN48 for the ICE40 FPGA, the pads are really tight. They're like manufacturing tight. I should have loosened them up, really, for prototyping, made them a bit longer and wider really tight getting on there and I don't think I put enough pressure on it so um, a few of the contacts were looking rather dodgy uh, which I still haven't fixed yet but anyhow, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this a bit later um, so one of the problems that I had is uh, if you remember the design let me see if I can bring up CAD bear with me Uh, where's that gone? So check the See if I can show you. So on the board here, um, hold on a sec. I know this. This this says uh, alloy on it. Forgive me. I'm just going to use it for demonstration purposes. Um, I know this is a slightly modified version. Can you see the cursor on here? It didn't always show. Um, so this is the ice forty here, and. Um, this is the ESP S2, sorry, 32 S2. And below this, we have uh, a quad SPI flash, uh, sorry, quad SPI RAM. Uh, and then we have a quad SPI flash, this one here. So this puppy here was a bit of a problem because if you note, uh, the cap is very close here. That actually looks closer than it is because I'm showing the stop here and the stop is wider than the actual pads. Um, there is some isolation between the two, but it is quite quite tight, quite close. So anyhow, the um, ones that I ordered originally, I mean, these aren't very big. Uh, but I can't focus on that. these puppies yeah i won't be able to focus on that but anyhow uh that so i ordered some large ones because i thought it'd be really nice to try the 128 megabits even though i'm not planning on putting those on the final product um but that is effectively 16 megs of flash which could be useful and i'm interested in doing that on one of the other products like a more advanced version of alloy than this one the bigger one actually a bigger board called the MX um, and I figured I'd use that now unfortunately it turns out that that was a wide soik or SOP8 which is a two one minute um, about 7.2 mil wide as opposed to if you look at the drawings here, these ones are based on the narrow soik or the narrow SOP8, 
uh, packages which are about 520 or something like that um, sorry 5.2 mil across so um, when that stuff arrived I thought oh well, I'll just try and squeeze on the 128 because it was only a bit wider and I could fit it on I the legs would would fit onto the pads and I soldered it on I thought that'd be great so when I came to actually look at it working um, the first thing I tried to do is I mean it's quite a complex process because I've got lots of different layers on the software and firmware from here but what I was doing was trying to actually talk to it and get it uploaded now in this case that's much more complicated than it normally would be so compared to say the development board so the way that the expressive ESP32 development boards have worked historically is you have a separate USB UART chip on board um, like a CHP540 or a Cypress one I'm not sure which ones they use actually I can't remember but the point is, normally it, it has a default UART on the ESP UART 0, which you can use to upload the bit file to. And so it has a bootloader in the chip itself. But normally you do that over USB uh, through the USB UART or virtual UART chip. So most of the development boards have these. So if you go and buy one of those small silo type boards or whatever, then it would have this. If you go, the big one I've got here, the Kaluga uh, board also has one as well. <clears throat> now in our case, what we're doing is we're using the new ESP32 S2. Um, and if you look on this board, there isn't anything there um, that has a separate uh, part that does the USB UART conversion because what we're trying to do is we're trying to use the built-in OTG USB that's the whole point of using the S2 ESP32 S2 rather than the ESP32 because that's this built-in OTG however support is quite recent for that that's being added not not all of the support has been added yet to the S2 it's still relatively new the bulk of it has been added not all of it um, so I'm trying to upload to the built-in OTG so when you plug it in it does come up it comes up as the ESP32 device for example in Windows with a question mark it doesn't have a drive for it but it also comes up as a port com line in my case um, so I know I'm getting it up so what you'd normally then do is using the ESP hyphen IDF, that's their uh, software system that you download, and their, that's their tools that you use to program the ESP32, and it has all the development libraries and everything else. But it's automated. It even has a menu config thing, which is kind of cool that you can run. But you have to pass in um what it is you're talking to so of course i'm running this in windows subsystem for linux so i'm passing in forward slash dev forward slash you know tty s9 for com9 uh, as the uh as the port and then also the default rate for some reason is way up at uh, 480,000 board, um, which is really high. And I know on the Kaluga, I had to go in and edit the files to take that down to like uh, 115, 200 board. Otherwise, you get packet failures when you try and flash it. So, anyhow, you run the IDF command to do the flash, you pass in the port number, and you can also uh, pass in the board rate as well. Uh, or it's in a setting file in you know in the make file you can go in and edit that and change the rate so at this point so I managed to get the flash chip on there and then straight away um, I got a problem bringing the board up 
and I clearly wasn't seeing any writing to flash and normally what you see is it will write to certain parts certain sections of the flash and, and I just wasn't seeing that so um, I checked a whole bunch of things that were shorts etc 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 now it turns out because I put this larger flash on there the one of the pins was actually um, bumping into the ground of that decoupling cap there because it was a wider chip it was actually pushing beyond the pad and onto the pad of the uh, the uh, the cap so after I finally worked this out I thought well I can't use that trouble is I didn't have any flash chips big enough other than these ones which are in this wide SOP8 package um, the other thing that was irritating this was a, a Desco 128 megabit or 16 megabyte flash chip uh, the data sheet at the top shows that it's a narrow they've obviously done a copy and paste somewhere from another data sheet so I went in and I double checked and did think oh well I'm going to order some narrow ones but I thought when I looked at it with the part number because the data sheet indicated like a narrow sort um, that this was the right one but obviously it wasn't so I thought go down to the end of the data sheet you can normally find um, normally find all the package variants they normally list them and if you're lucky on a really good date sheet they show you the packages as well including the uh, landing patterns and stuff that you need if you're designing the uh, uh, the CAD package you know that's going to go down and sure enough down the bottom there wasn't an option for the narrow uh, SOP8 there was only the wide one and I bing okay right I should have looked all the way through the uh, data sheet and I would have realized that what I was ordering was not the narrow one I shouldn't have just taken the stuff at the top uh, this can happen in data sheets you just got to double check everything I was in a bit of a hurry when I ordered the flash chips to be fair so it's my own fault um, but that also led me to another problem because I can't use these chips because I can't get a narrow one. There's no way I could get it to work on this board. So I then had to order some more flash chips from, uh, in this case, I went to Final. Now I'm in the UK, you can get Final next day. Um, but I couldn't find a 128, I could find a 4 megabyte, i.e., a 32 megabit flash, a Desco one again. Uh, definitely narrow double triple checked it and then put the order in next day well he arrived so I put it on the board sorry desoldered the other one and then put this one on the board it's actually quite easy to do because these packages are actually quite large they're not like really teeny tiny ones you can eat quite easily get these on and off I had to clean up the pads and stuff first because of that short with a cap uh, just make it all clean bit of flux etc got it back on there happy with that so I then go back through the curve I had to then go and change all the settings so I'm now using different flash shots to what I was before and because the software I'm using has to use a partition and stuff uh, you need to get the flash sizes right change all that out then get back to the programming so I'm talking to the flash and I see it come up and I see it writing the partitions to the flash and it says checking hash check hash check hash check at the end of it and I'm thinking oh that's good and then it as far as it's concerned it's done that completed and not had any issues and I'm thinking well hey we're on um, so I tried to bring up circuit Python after flashing that on my ver local version which has the changes in for this board reset it comes drop back into boot again and it won't get out of boot it keeps going to boot so at this point i realize ah oh, right do some measurements on the board boots tied down low permanently that's not help so uh, i then re-examine the circuit one of the things that i have on there is um 
in order to try and save the pins what I did was I tied the done pin on the FPGA which is an open drain output to the mode pin which is determining whether it boots, boot, goes into boot mode on the flash or not on reset thinking it will be fine because I was thinking that's not going to be active at startup so then go back double check the lattice data sheet I've been looking at it anyhow to get the timings for writing the flashing firmware um, which I'll show you in a bit as well because we're going to spend some time on that software and um, sure enough uh, after reset uh, that does get activated and pulled down at the beginning just when the bloody ESP is booting so that means that it was always pulling it down so then I've you know look back at the circuit uh, I wonder if I can I know this is a newer version but it probably still has the same thing on so if I look let's just turn the layers on here hold on yeah. so if you look at this signal here the yellow signal there's the FPGA here there's the done signal down here if you follow the yellow track up it goes to what is called D0 here and then that goes on further it then dives down to the bottom back up to the top I've got the virus turn on so you can't see that going through there then it actually goes to the LED so I was using that to show the LED and then it goes back round down to this button which is the mode button button control what it boots up in and then back round to here where it goes to the to the top of the ESP S2 so I had a good look and thought well how the hell am I going to get around this now unfortunately the yellow layer here that this represents is one of the inner layers of the board so I can't go in there and cut it uh, but I was thinking maybe I can put a you know saw through here because there's nothing else here it's only the yellow inner track that's coming here so I could actually cut it and disable the done well the reason I can get away with disabling the done is you don't need the done pin to program the FPGA. It's it's there as a convenience so you know if it has been programmed. So it kind of comes back with a handshake and tells you whether it has or hasn't. But you can still program it even if you don't look at the handshake. So I figured if I can find some way of disabling that, I will. Of course it's in the inner layer but I thought well this is going to be a bit harsh putting hacksaw on the side of the board and cutting through all those layers there's all sorts of other issues that you can do like short between the layers between the ground and the VCC inner layer sorry pre volt free inner layer that wouldn't be good and then I went back here and I noticed there is this short excursion here it's not before that pin unfortunately but there's a short excursion here where it goes from an inner layer down to the bottom layer before it goes back on the top layer and if it's on the bottom that means I can get to it so uh, in fact I don't know if you can see it on here it's probably going to be very small but uh, probably not. if you look at the base here if you look over here just in front of my finger can you see that little diagonal cut scraping so i used you know uh like a, an artist's cutting knife i always have those and some fresh plates uh so you can scrape off the solder mask that's the black bit in this case you can get to the track you can cut the track you have to be a bit careful because there's other tracks so if you look at this design here there's a track right underneath it here and you don't want to cut through that because it's going to really mess other things up as well so um, I actually managed to get to that be able to cut the track that then dislocates the mode boot signal from this yellow signal here that goes all the way back to the done it does mean that this pin is now disabled so there's nothing connected to it apart from done so I could still look at the done externally if I put pins in here and put it on a breadboard and put an LED on it for example but more importantly it frees the dump pin. so I then repowered it up bingo uh, the other thing I notice it comes up green rather than greeny blue 
that's because the done pin is connected to the blue on the RGB LED. So it was now green, which is how it should have been. So it told me that was working. Plug it back in. Um, now when I do the reset, it resets, but not in boot mode anymore, bootloader mode anymore, which is exactly what I wanted. Bingo. So it's now booting up. Uh, not in boot mode, looking for incoming on the serial port, but it's talking to the flash, loading its image, loading the partitions from the flash, and then reading it in, coming up with circuit Python, except it didn't. So I could tell it wasn't coming up in the boot mode anymore, because when I go and look at my device manager, I can see the COM port isn't there, and the question mark ESP isn't there. So the OTG is not showing up anymore. And the OTG shouldn't show up anyhow in circuit Python, not in the same way, but um, I'm seeing nothing. Something else. Damn it. <sighs> Try flashing again. Nothing. Try fiddling with all the images. Have I got the images wrong? Is the partition wrong? Lost a good number of hours looking at this. Um, then in the end, I start thinking, well, it's going to be the flash. Uh, maybe this flash chip's not 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 supported. Now I've been using these flash chips for years and years. Um, but most of what I stuff, most of what I do, microcontroller-wise, is based on American or European microcontrollers. Uh, I don't have as much experience with the expressive stuff or the Chinese microcontrollers. So I thought I'll go looking in the forums and documentation, trying to find out. Because they have flash chips already on their modules. So I figure it's going to be fairly easy to find these. Can I find what they use? <laughs> it's really not easy. They don't seem to tell you that. They don't seem to want to tell you that either. Even looking at forums, I've seen people ask the question blankly and then the forum thread just dies, it ends. There's no answers to it. So they're obviously not willing to tell you everything about what's in some of their modules and stuff. So I start looking at some of the other boards around, see if I can fathom out what they use. And then I finally come across this thread. Their search, by the way, on their forum is shite. The forum is uh, like a lot of Chinese sites. It's just very slow. It's not good. I, you nearly always get errors when you do a search. Mostly it doesn't come back with anything. I don't mean any results. I mean it comes back with a without the web page responding, literally. Um, but I did go manually through the hardware threads to try and see if I could get any clue. Um, and there was a couple of pointers. And then I found some stuff. Where did I find it? I can't remember exactly where I found it. It might have been on a forum, actually. And I found this post where they said something like... Uh, Oh, we use the popular ones from, yeah. and they did mention one which was from, um, I forget what they call, they make the STM32 uh, lookalikes, and they also make a lot of flash, and they start with, I think it's GDQ25, uh, 16, or 32 or 128 or whatever it might be um, so I then started the search thing in oh well they're probably using oh look I've got a friend it's one of our cats he's probably gonna be noisy I'll tell you about him if he starts being noisy but um he uh, they obviously use these um, Flash chips are much more popular in these areas. He's going for a drink. Look, he's in the sink behind me. That sparkle, that cat. He's the boy cat. We have a pair. There's a boy and a girl. So I then started searching. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be difficult because I don't want to order from one of the Asian suppliers. It's going to take ages to get here. I need something to get here like sharpish. And I don't want to order too many either. I'm not sure which ones work because they weren't specific. So uh, I did a search and then luckily I found that Mauser stopped some of these. Um, I think it was the GD 
June 25. Uh, I can't remember the other letter, and then the size 32. Uh, we might get this meowing accompaniment. <laughs> Anyhow, Mauser had some. And then I found there was a reference to another supplier, which is very well known uh, in Asia. So I ordered some of those as well. They're also better prices than stuff one. But I was taking more of a chance because this wasn't specifically mentioned. Um, when uh, luckily Mauser had these as well, so I thought I ordered a, I ordered a bunch of different ones, and they use FedEx Mauser, and they give you these quotes. Oh, it's going to be here in like normally like a week, which is unusual. It didn't used to be anything like that, but quite often it comes up really quickly. So luckily, that arrived this morning. Hurrah! Uh, instead of Monday, which is what it was scheduled for. So I got some of these chips. So I managed to solder one on, um, one of these other ones. And Bob's your uncle. Uh, I got straight into, um, into the flash. Wrote it restarted it and it came up bingo so anyhow i'll show you some of that later because i've done a little bit of testing on that as well so i'll come back to that let me tell you about this cat it's driving me mad at the moment sparkle come here come up you come here you're gonna sit there or are you gonna hassle me you will calm down after a bit but um we recently found out he was losing some weight we recently found out he was diabetic <sighs> who knew diabetic cats huh uh his sister's fine she's smaller than he is but he was quite i wouldn't say he was like big big fat i mean he's quite um you know he's medium sized let's say uh, but anyway i was losing lots of weight so i had to send him to a vet and they did all sorts of tests and then they worked out that um, he is diabetic. You can't actually see him very well on this picture, which is a shame. So he will probably sit there meowing at me and hassling me in the corner. But ever since that, he's just like, I have to be very strict about his food. So he, um, he gets fed, well, they both get fed first thing in the morning. And then they get fed. 12 hours later anyhow they have to do all the curves and stuff you know for his uh, glucose levels etc for when they work out prescription for the insulin so when I feed him in the morning I have to inject him with insulin and then when I feed him in the evening I have to, and there's no feeding in between but you know they're really strict about it they've got to keep his levels right but he just seems to be always hungry it's like a, he's turned into a dog uh you know how dogs continually hassle you for food and things i never used to do that so yeah he's continually has me and whenever i eat something he's like meows at me and if i ignore him for too long he meows at me as well so but hey ho he's relatively healthy now on this thing but i could say he is turning into a bit of a dog he wants to eat all the time and we have to be really careful what we leave lying around because he'll try and eat it otherwise but anyhow, he might be back. He's just gone out and heard the cat flap then. So he might be back. So if you hear the meowing, it's probably Sparkle. Right. So um, let me talk about what we're going to do today. Let me see if I can bring up my notes. Do I have some notes here somewhere? Okay. So, um, so that's what happened with the flash chips. So that was a bit of a nightmare. This kind of stuff catches you out all the time, I'm afraid. It's just half of the course it's you know it normally happens when you're in a real hurry you know something goes wrong and you have to order new components you've used a landing pattern you haven't used before and it's not quite right or something there's quite often issues um but I, i've now got it working to a certain degree and I'll, i can i can show you that later as well um but for the moment, let, uh, one of the things I wanted to do is actually go into the software using the development board because that in itself was an interesting uh, 
interesting exercise for me but I think it may be useful for you guys as well I'm presuming the reason that you want to you're here is because you want to you know uh, get some insight into how this works you know when we build stuff so there's some interesting parts to that as well and it's very on uh, on on track with what we're talking about let me just switch the view back hold on so one of the things uh, that I need to cover here is uh, we're gonna have a look at the boards in a second so I've done the flash um, is there any other community stuff uh, we've had some issues with the site with some of the icons on the forum uh, I haven't completely solved that, but it seems to be the standard avatar icons that are generated that you get when you're a new user. So if you haven't uploaded one, you may be affected by this. So in, instead of seeing the normal avatar or icon, you'll see a broken pick type icon. Um, I haven't found a way of fixing that. I get some rather weird messages from this software. It needs updating and it it's a bit stuck in getting the versions up to date and I need to talk to uh, my colleague and I can't get hold of him at the moment who did the install because I think he had some issues before but he knows how to solve, resolve those I think one of the things I need to do is get the forum software updated the discourse software and then maybe we can overcome that because I think it might be using an older service to generate the avatars that may not be available anymore I have tried changing some of the settings for that but it's, I think that might work going forward but it doesn't work fixing the old ones because it expects those icons to be there and they're not uh, but if anyone's got like a broken icon just upload your own uh, avatar or image or whatever and then it will use that and it will solve the problem I have told a few people that have got that issue but not everyone is necessarily listening um so that's on the forum anything else on the forum that i've missed let me just double check myself i've probably got it open here somewhere um i mentioned this stream oh i made a thread for alloy that's separate now rather than just putting it all on the stream stream thread um we've got some good feedback on the what do people use small fpga boards for as well it's definitely worth checking that thread out some interesting stuff there i think that's it on the forum front i don't think there's anything else that I need to cover uh, community wise do I need to cover anything I've not got anything new on the Black Ice 5 I do have some new ideas but I'll cover that on a subsequent stream I need to think through some changes on, on that um, what else have we got on the list uh, Okay, now I think we're clear to um, to move on to the software. So let me remind you first. Let me get the um, let me show you. So this is the setup I've been using to develop stuff. For fear of boring people that have already seen this, but for anyone that's not seen it before. Um, on the right hand side you have the Kaluga one which is an expressive development board which has the ESP32 S2 on it and lots of headers which is really cool I've modded it to expose the OTG USB on the power USB ports they don't do that by default uh, if you look carefully you'll see there's some little mob wires here bit of fun um, just makes it easier for me to develop rather than having to use the JTEG and serial uh, USB because so I've got an FTDI chip here for driving that um, on the left hand side you've got the lattice breakout board for the UP5K the ICE40 Ultra Plus UP5K board 
because we're using the Ultra Plus chip. Um, and the way that this is actually uh, wired up is I have a bunch of GPIOs here, effectively. I have a reset signal, which is this one here, which resets the ICE FPGA. I've disconnected it from the internal flash chip on here. So I want to program the ICE chip directly because that's the way it's going to work on Alloy. So that's where the jumpers are off here. And then the other pins are a chip select, the master out serial in. Um, that's how it's labeled on here. Um, clock, chip select, and master in serial out. Or you could say SOSI and CISO if you want to use uh, uh, serial rather than master. It's a bit better. You can use P for peripheral if you want. But anyhow, that's what I'm doing there. Because the way that you program the Lattice ICE 40 range of chips is you basically use serial SPI, synchronized SPI. So you need a clock. You need the uh, data into the ICE 40, and then you need a chip select. You also need to be able to reset the chip. And there's an order that you have to do things in. It's very important. Um, I can show you, actually, what this looks like with any luck. This is going to be fun. Mm -mm -mm. There's a nice thing called the ICE programming configuration. I can just probably add, add this in. Hold on. Display window capture. Uh, let's do this first. In fact, there is one here. Let me see if that works. Yay! Look at that. Let me just bring that across. Hold on. I need to perhaps change size slightly first. Hold on. Bear with me. Colleague again. Let me zoom in on this as well because it's bloody huge. There we go. Hopefully you can see this. Oh. What the hell? There we go. <coughs> so on here, bear with me a sec. When we're programming the ICE 40 using serial, um, it's actually fairly simple. <coughs> There's a little uh, flow chart here which is quite useful. I look at the top, it says C done equals zero. I should have got it from that. I should have remembered this flow chart. Bound to pull the um, boot down now. I know where I'm going to put that as well, by the way. I'm not going to tie it to the boot. I'm going to tie it to the BQS pin. The BQS pin is a signaling pin for the umbilical communications link between the um, ESP32S2 and the ICE40 for when it's running to exchange information, not just programming. So I'm going to use that instead. Um, so here you can see is power on, reset, release, reset high, holding, reset low, delays the start of the configuration, obviously. Then it checks the SS pin. So you have to set the SS pin or the select pin in ESPI terms on the ICE 40 to tell it whether it's going to boot where it's going to boot up from flash or whether it's going to be booted externally, i.e. programmed by an external microcontroller or some such. So the, the state of that pin is important that you set that before you go and talk to it. Uh, and you can see that decision tree here on the diagram. Configure as an SPI peripheral or look at the internal configuration if you've stored it in the one-time programmable memory, which we don't, or configure it from the attached SPI flash prom that's connect, often connected. Um, for example, if you look at our Black Eyes product, we have one of those. Again, it's an Adesco one, fairly standard. Um, 
then it puts C done to one and then we're back where we are so let's look at the uh, details of that because it's interesting you can see the pins on there look. Uh, because the actual programming of the ice 40 and I've been through this a number of times so I've gotten used to it that's the way you wire it by the way um, so if you're controlling it from you know uh, oh that's the wrong one next one it's going to be using flash uh, when you're using it that's their software hold on we will get there eventually there you go so if you're if you're programming it from a uh, microcontroller or some such they call it application processor here um, you're applying the um, SPI data into it you're reading the SPI out you don't actually need that frankly and then you're providing the select chip select equivalent which also tells it which way around it is um, I whether you're programming or it's booting on flash and then you need to provide the clock and obviously you need to look at the C done because that's giving you a status back but you're controlling the reset of the ice 40 so you reset it you set the SS to the right value and then you have to do some extra bits like flushing it making sure that the buffer is clear inside um, and then you can activate the SS signal the chip select signal and start writing the binary digits that you need to write to program the ICE 40 the FPGA and then even at the end you have to go through another process where you flush it out you need to go for a you need to wait a certain amount of time you also need to flush out all of the other bits and pieces so during that period what you do is you you you, you write the configuration of the muxes etc for the device but you also have different sections in this binary that you're transferring to it that may include things like the contents of the internal SRAM or the block memory within inside the chip as well as any flags etc so it's broken into different sections I won't go into the detail about that you don't actually need to know that because the open source tools manage most of that um, the only time you need to do that is if you are manipulating those in some clever way when we originally wrote the black ice programming software back in the early mystorm days we did actually partition that binary up into its different sections which was unnecessary we didn't realize at the time we thought we might need to do that um, but really you just got to take the binary contents of the file that's produced by the open source tools uh, and you've got to upload the relevant chunk of that and the, make sure that the crc is right crc64 if it receives any corruption during the process it will the crc will be wrong and it won't flag that it's done right and here is the critical bit that you have to do so this this breaks down exactly what programming it involves which is nice of them to provide so here you see at the start the state of CDUM. So as soon as you reset it, it says wait 200 microseconds minimum, right? Before you do anything, um, you want to have the clock in a high state. You need to have SS chip select low because you're you're going to program it. So that's the state it needs to be. Okay, and then when you lift the reset, so you need at least 200 microseconds, and then you lift the reset. It then reads the SS pin and knows that it's going to be programmed. Uh, the other thing you've then got to do is send some clock pulses where, and it doesn't matter what the data is actually, that's why it's grayed out here. So you need to go at least eight, eight clock cycles to clear whatever may be in its internal shift register effectively. Then you start writing the, the important binary bits, the bit bit image part uh, of the file and then when you get to the end of that you have to go through this extra procedure here um, where you write about 149 clock, cy cl clock cycles to clear things out give you enough time for it to be done so it's actually not that complicated but there are some tricks with it uh, you don't have to adhere to all of it but there are certain bits that you do have to ad adhere to okay so we're set up 
to do that so let me show you then because this is interesting um i'll give you a reminder as well so let's look at first of all let me see if i can find what i'm going to do is show you i'm going to work backwards from what i started with to kind of something that's a bit better because that journey is an interesting one from a number of different angles um and let me also contextually explain what's going on as well um, so I'm going to need, what am I going to need, is it this one, I need to find the original, that one, so which one's that, that's the code, examples, let me find the old one, so let's copy that. Do, 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 do. Right, so let me explain what happens first. So um, we're going to be using the Kaluga board. Let me get rid of the um, clock timing diagram because we don't actually need that. Um, let's just turn that off. What I do need is the PowerShell video capture device. Let me just quickly, before I do this, remind you how we're wired up here. So if we go back to this diagram here, the cat, on the left you have the ESP32 and then on the right you have the ICE40 FPGA up 5K. And between them you have a number of lines. Most of those lines here are, are yellow, but there's some red ones at the bottom as well. Okay, it's the red ones that we're actually interested in because those are effectively driving the SPI. So that's our um, serial out, our serial clock, our chip select. Uh, and then a reset pin, etc., going to the uh, ice 40. Now, normally, if you look at black eyes, what we do is we, because they were based on the STM 32s, we mostly wrote this in C, and then later I converted that over to a kind of C++ or C++ if you like, rather than C++, i.e., object oriented but not templates and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and we use the STM32 libraries to help us do the USB, etc. Now, in this case, it's different because what we're running here is we're running the ESP32 S2 chip, and I want to use MicroPython. Um, and yes, I could have written this in C, but then why not eat my own dog food here? The whole point of going that route. Um, was to show that you can quickly prototype stuff using what is effectively MicroPython. Uh, and the thinking with this, is, in this case, we're actually using CircuitPython, which is Adafruit's flavor of MicroPython, for want of a better term. It actually includes MicroPython, the previous version, not the current version, in it. But they've standardized a lot of the APIs so that it works across their different boards, mainly their Feathers and their Express Series boards. Um, the standardizing of the API is where they differed from MicroPython, uh, which is why they've kind of forked off a little bit now. Um, it does make it more difficult the fact that they're doing a different thing to MicroPython. Now, MicroPython doesn't currently support the ESP32 S2. There is an attempt to get that done. Um, so I knew that, because I, I wanted to actually support both, but I can't support the MicroPython yet. So I have to support CircuitPython first anyhow. So I figured I'd work on that. Now, the point of using something like Python is, well, all the criticisms tend to be great language, right? But, you know, when you do embedded, you do it in C. C is a lot more efficient, it's faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, 
age-old arguments. Anyhow, the reason, one of the reasons that I chose this particular chip is because I can run MicroPython on it, and I did want to use um, MicroPython. That was part of the differences between this and the black ice type things. That's why we've got this new type of board called the Alloy. It's this fusion of using Python C and HDL or one sort or another. I'll come back to all of that bit later. So I need to eat my own dog food here. There's no point just writing this in C, which would be the logical approach and using the ESP IDF framework. I figured I can get Py get circuit Python running on this and then eat my own dog food and use it to program. So that's what I'm going to do. So basically what I'm doing is I'm writing Python to actually do the flashing of the ICE 40 from the ESP 32S2. Uh, and the reason that you can do this is because it's nice, quick, easy to prototype, etc. You can optimize later. That's the thinking here. So you can always drop down in C and improve it. So most of the stuff that you're running most of the time in CircuitPython is actually written in C. The low level stuff. It's all written in C. You're just using Python to kind of orchestrate things really. And going the next step beyond, which is where I'm coming from here, why I want Python on here is your next stage of optimization is not having it run in C, but having it in HDL running on the FPGA. So any problem that you can solve, you've got several different levels you can go down to achieve the optimization that you need to do at different stages. Plus you can do things that you just can't do with microcontrollers with the FPGA. So why not approach that in terms of programming the FPGA? Rather than writing it in C again, let's use the MicroPython. So that's what I'm going to be showing here running on this kit. So I've got MicroPython installed. Um, let me take you back here on this board running. It's difficult to see here. If I turn that light off, you'll see a MicroPython has like a status LED. Can you see it there? And it changes color depending on what it's doing, where it's running, waiting, etc. etc. And that's one of these, uh, like uh, Neo Pixels or um dot star so it has two 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 lines it's not driven directly like an rgb it's serial so you have a clock and a data to program the uh, values for the rgb they're quite commonly used on um circuit python boards so there's a little driver that's already built in so that when circuit python builds in it puts it in various different states it's actually quite useful from a diagnostic point of view but as i pointed out in the not last stream, stream before that, I think. Uh, when I first tried to use the Kaluga board as a development board, it was difficult because there isn't actually an LED connected to a GPIO pin. So if you want to do Blinky, you can't. I had to hook something up externally, which was a bit daft, I thought, for a dev board. But there you go. So uh, let's bring up now. So I'm going to just copy the old. Um, the old version, well, it's close to the old version, not originally how it looked, um, but it's it's close. And then I'm going to share with you the, um, the code that I started with. Now, the way that Circuit Python works. So when I boot up in Circuit Python on this dev board, what happens is the USB is partitioned into two devices, a CDC USB serial device running at 9600 relatively low speed. Uh, that enables you to access the output uh, monitor. So if there's problems or whatever, it will tell you. But you can also access the Python REPL, uh, the MicroPython REPL, which is kind of cool. If you can go straight into MicroPython. The other part of the USB boots up as an external storage device which is automatically mounted by windows so basically i get a d drive comes up and i get a cdc com port that comes up so i can then use putty or something else to go and open the uh com port let me show you that here actually I can also use uh, just use the Turk cat, the serial device in um, 
port 9 hold on in um, Windows subsystem for Linux as well if I can share this let me just add this window capture uh, I wonder if it's already here no let's see add a new one okay why does it do that Agreed. So at the top here, you should see my putty terminal. It's not very big for me. Hopefully, it'll be bigger for you guys. Um, but what it's saying there is press any key to enter the REPL. So if I go in, I can do so. And I've got my Python REPL terminal. So I can do import, uh, God, I forget what it is. Is it board? Something like that. If I spell it right, of course. And then I can do use the normal things like DIR or help or something. See what is on that particular object. Bingo. Look, so I can see all the things. Because it's the development board, there's quite a few bits that have been designated pin wise. So what you're looking here is the pin mapping and naming of the board which is a standard circuit python thing so i can then go and use one of those pins to do something for example but i'm not going to do that i'm going to get out of the REPL. so that's instantaneous python which is useful for testing stuff i'm going to get out of there control d takes me out and straight away what it tries to do is um it runs a bunch of files that it finds on this mounted device from our perspective it's a mounted device okay let me just show you what that looks like so this part is the um, mounted USB storage device so let me just move that actually over to here for a sec okay so under windows here you can see there's circuit pi d so that's the d drive comes up a circuit pi. I'm using Windows by the way. Those that weren't familiar. Um, and then on this you can see there's a bunch of standard files. Um, you've got a bunch of library files which may contain the libraries that you need to do run the Python that you want. In fact what you put in there is actually pre-compiled libraries so it's like the bytecode versions of them. The Python bytecode versions. But more importantly you've got this file here called code. It looks for some standard name Python files, one of which is code.py, and that's what we're looking at here. And if I was to edit that now, uh, so I'm just going to open code.py, bear with me. I've already got it open somewhere here, I believe. Okay. Now, um, what you see, I'm not going to do it now, but what you see, what you saw before in the uh, putty window, um, you actually saw it run what was in that code file here. So as soon as I came out of the REPL, you see it running code.py. Um, in this particular one, uh, I've also added 
if we go back to the code window sorry the um, file window can you see I've got another file at the bottom here called logic.bin now that is a binary file that's produced by the FPGA tools so that's that, that's what we get from running Yosis first on some simple blinky Verilog that I wrote that then gets converted into a JSON file which then gets taken on by next PNR which is the same as Arachne PNR or similar to Arachne PNR which is part of the tool which then creates the effectively the uh, uh, the sections of that binary file the bit bit image for the FPGA uh, and then we run a pack command on that which packs it together into a nice binary which we can then rename in this case I've renamed it logic.bin instead of blinky.bin the reason I've called it logic.bin is because in my code that I've written it always looks for a file called logic.bin now what would happen is if I go and change this code file here the Python file as soon as I do a save on that file the uh, MicroPython automatically reloads that file and runs it so all you need to do is if you're editing that file live editor every time you save it will run on the device so it's a really convenient way of programming things particularly for newcomers much more transparent than worrying about having to send files backwards and forwards or do anything clever like use a debugger or something you just edit the file and change it so anyhow let's just now go to that code file um, here and let me step through it's probably going to be a bit messy because it's the old one I bet it's all a bit messy, but let's not worry about that too much. Let me add the window in here. Do, 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 do. Oh, window capture. Let's catch the uh, edit tool. Oh, there's already one here. I wonder if it will get it. Hold on. Yes, marvellous. Let me just resize it slightly, gents and ladies. See if it fits. Let's bring myself forward. Hold on. Um, do, 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 do. I need to. Where am I? I can't find me. Am I this one? Uh, move the editor down a bit. There we go. Let me show you guys. And. Bring that to the front. So there's some of our code. So let's just look at the top. I mean, when you pull stuff into Python, I uh, use the import command. Uh, you all nearly always include import the board stuff because that, that gives you the board support. That's your hardware abstraction layer. Digital I.O. is a library for handling things like GPIOs. Really simple library. And the time library is for doing time delays, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've then got a bunch of functions, def functions here. And then I've got what it runs. Um, the first thing that I do here after some function definitions is I create a signature that I know that I'm looking for. Okay, this one here. That signature is common in the ICE 40 files. So there's normally like a preface or a, a bunch of stuff before the real bit image in the file that's added on that we don't need. So what we have to do is we, we literally have to skim through the file. We look for the signature and then when we see the signature, we know where we are. We know where the start of the, the FPGA image is. So that's what that signature is here. And these are, um, what do they call them? Byte strings. 
okay, which is the efficient way of you doing your strings in the micro Python. Number of bytes. So this is the size of the image file, the bit file for this ICE uh, 40 up 5K. Depending on which one you're programming, they're going to have different sizes. And it's a good idea to know how big it is because you know when to stop reading the file and stop programming it. Particularly important for the CLC. Um, the next thing I'm doing here in MicroPython here is I'm setting up a pin that I'm using, a GPIO that I'm using to control the reset input of the ICE 40. So the, the output pin of this is uh, the ESP use this kind of GPIO and then a number. Uh, so in the particular definition file for circuit Python for the Kaluga uh, one board, these are IO33. These these correspond to the pins in the data sheet um, for GPIO numbers, and they all. Um, Oh, somebody said it's too small. Is that the putty that's too small, Ed? Putty text. Is the text editor too small? Because I can increase the size if if that's too small. Oh, no. There we go. Better? Okay, well, the code window is a bit bigger now. May have to reduce it down if we get too big anyhow. But anyhow, so... Uh, this 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 designation here, which is defined in the Circuit Python, um, what do they call it? Port for the ESP32 S2. Uh, this will be designated pin IO33, uh, GPIO33, but it, they're also labelled on the header pins as IO33 or GPIO33. So when you write, when you do a Circuit Python port. Uh, there are a bunch of rules in how you do that and you should either refer to the schematic or the labeling on the board itself so that you get a correspondence. Of course you can use whatever you like but it's a good idea to make them you know correspond as, at least at some level. So what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm using this pin and I'm going to call it RST. So basically I've got a like a Python object here that represents a GPIO pin. And the GPIO pin has certain functionality. So the first thing I'm going to do is tell it that I want the direction of this pin to be an output pin. So it can obviously be an input or an output, or it could be an in-out, i.e. it could be something that changes dynamically. Uh, the next pin I want here, which is GPIO 34 on this particular board, is the SSEL pin, which that SS, excuse me, the SSEL thing is um, designation is something that's used in the lattice. Um, Timing diagram and data sheet. But it could be CS or NCS because it's normally active low, right? Uh, so I'm attaching that pin 34. Again, that's uh, output from the point of view of the S32. The S32 is driving that into the ICE 40. And that controls what mode the uh, uh, the ICE 40 programming is going to occur. So whether it's going to go and read the flash itself or whether it's going to be programming externally from us in this case. It's also used as a select pin when we're actually doing the transfer over SPI. Um, the other thing that I'm doing here is I'm saying um, I need a serial clock pin. Uh, using the clock as a designation here probably isn't the best idea but anyhow I should, normally I should use SCK so again it's an output pin and then the final one uh, is really the data that I'm sending out over the SPI which is the S out pin and again it's output from the point of view of the ESP32 so the other thing I'm doing here is I'm using GPIO so I should, I should explain it when I wrote this original piece of code the ESP32 S2 board support, the port for the S2, had an issue with its SPI to do with DMA, which meant that it wasn't working properly, which is why I did this as bit banging. But actually, it's a good idea to do it as bit banging anyhow in many cases because 
what we have to do is slightly non-standard from a normal SPI because we have to do all the uh, clever stuff at the beginning and the end, you know, the kind of preamble, also the setting up the ICE 40 out of reset and also the post uh, clearing the buffs, etc. Um, so I didn't have any choice anyhow because the SPI wasn't working for this port, so I was going to bit bang it. Uh, and I normally bit bang because it's just easier more, rather than worrying about things like polarity and stuff and phase. And if you know about SPI, um, that's just a few more parameters to confuse the hell out of you when you're trying to get something new working. Whereas with bit banging, you kind of know what's going on. Um, I'm then setting up the initial values here. So I'm setting the uh, select line high, true sign, obviously. Reset value, false, low, and then I'm setting the SSL value false, I'm taking that low, then I'm setting the clock value to true high. I'm then holding that for 200 microseconds or 0 0.2 milliseconds, effectively. I'm then coming out of reset by taking the reset line high. I'm then waiting an appropriate amount of time, in this case, 1200 microseconds. I'm then setting the uh, select value to true. So I'm disabling it now. So this is the opposite of what you'd normally be doing on a SPI transfer because you normally it's an active low signal. So I'm taking the true, I'm disabling it. And then I'm sending what what's called dummy clock. So I need to give it, I'm basically flushing uh, input serial or input um, uh, shift register because it could have woken up with garbage in it after the reset right uh, so that's on that diagram it showed you what what you should be doing is is flushing that so you effectively want eight clock cycles so I'm doing eight dummy clocks so I'm calling a function here called dummy clocks and it's really simple so look so this is the normal iteration you don't have a four quite the same for loop that you do in C but it, it, you can see some similarity here so for whatever this object is that we get from returning in range clocks now range clocks range is a way of generating a list Python uses lists think of them as arrays for want of a better thing so what this does is this creates a list of eight eight bytes if you like not necessarily bytes that it's creating, uh, but it actually creates from number zero to seven. That's what this does. And then for each one of those, that value will be assigned to whatever we name the variable here. In this case, uh, dummy, and I put an underscore before it saying, I don't care what it is. I'm not interested in the actual value. In this case, I know it's always the same. So what I then do is I take the clock line low, I assert the value on the serial data out and then I take the clock line value high in order to clock that data through and I do that effectively eight times so I, I clock through um, in this case a zero value uh, a load of zeros a bytes worth of zeros so that's all my dummy clock does at this start. So after that I then go into a proper select so I'm taking the select low so it's because it's an active low pin this means I'm now going to write data to it and now the ice 40 should have had everything it needs and it's ready to receive its bid image that it's going to use to program its internal muxes and BRAM and everything else. So before I do that I, I open up uh, if there's a file there uh, called logic.bin which is my binary file that I want to read uh, that has my bit image for the FPGA in it so I read that as a read file um, I, I, if there's an exception to opening that then I print out a simple message saying couldn't open file maybe the file is not on there um, maybe I've just installed circuit python and the drive doesn't have anything on there I haven't copied it binary file on there for the FPGA otherwise I do print file opened hurrah I've got the file 
Next, I set my byte count to zero because I'm going to count where I am in terms of sending the bytes that I'm reading out of the image file into the FPGA. Okay, so while not end of file, the way that Python reads file, this isn't very Pythonic, by the way, the way that I'm doing it here. At this point, I'm probably still in C mode thinking, oh, why doesn't it have this? So I quickly knock up a simple uh, not EOF. Okay, not very Pythonic, I know. Uh, but basically it reads one byte from the file uh, and then it makes sure that it's not an empty byte because when it gets to the end of the file it will be an empty byte there isn't an end of file code if you like uh, it then seeks back to get back to that byte that it's just read i.e. it sets the seek position back to where it was and then it returns whether that was an end of file or not logic so while it's not the end of the file while this the current bytes reading isn't the last one or sorry isn't an empty one uh byte count equals byte count plus one let's just increment there is no plus equals either in python which is annoying i know so you have to kind of do it a bit more uh traditionally um so i'm counting the bytes as i'm bringing them in here's my hex code so I'm going to read one byte and if the hex so now I'm looking for that first part of the signature because I know that starts with if we go back to here it starts with 7e okay that first byte should be 7e so if that is 7e I know I've hit potentially the first byte in the byte signature now you don't have to do that you could look at all the four bytes and do it that way because it's normally aligned on a four byte boundary but uh, i know in conversations i've had before with the guys that wrote talks people like david shaw and stuff i shouldn't assume that that's the case because that won't always be the case so anyhow let's just so i'm just going to read one 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 bit one hex bit byte at a time um, so I know I'm now uh, potentially at the signature, but it might not be. It might be in the preface before the signature. So I then FC back one byte. I then read four bytes because I know my signature is four bytes. And then I see if that looks like the signature should, i.e. that all the next four bytes that I read are all uh, exactly the same as the signature. Um, if it is, I say found bit image signature, and it uh, this is the Pythonic way of printing stuff out. Uh, Python three way, it, it was slightly, it was a bit more C like in the old Python two point seven, but in Python three way, you have this, and then these brackets get replaced by what this function passes in in terms of variables as they're converted, and you can have conversion types in here. So that they're represented differently depending on what your types are here in this case i just printed it printed out uh, simply i then seek back to the beginning of that signature because i'm now ready when i write my bit image file i need to include that signature part of it so that's part of the, the important part that the fpga looks for itself when it's given the bit it, the signature uh, when it's given the bit image it looks for that signature as well so i then say uh write bytes so i pass the file handle i don't think it's called a file handle in python but anyhow i put pass the file object or reference um to a function called write bytes so let's have a quick look at write bytes so what this does is it receives a bit file reference or handle it sets the byte count to zero uh, because this is effectively the start point of the true image rather than the file start point in terms of bytes and it's doing a byte count equals byte count plus one because it's going to count as it goes through so it reads one byte in this case uh, if the byte count is greater than the number of bytes we're at the end and we don't need to write anymore because we've already got the bit image uh, otherwise what it does is 
I know I've only got one byte in this byte, but it actually comes through as a byte byte list. This returns a list because it's multiple, it doesn't have to be one. So for B in bytes, just breaks that list down into the individual bytes. So for each byte, um, I then call write byte, which is another function that I've written. Um, all that write byte does is it serializes that byte using bit banging. So bits equals bin byte. So what this does, ooh, so this is Pythonic slightly. Uh, bin byte will turn a byte into a binary representation of like. If it was, uh, for example, free, it would return a string one one one. Okay. Um, but it would also return the notation before it of a, um, a tilde and a one to represent binary. So basically it returns a string that represents the binary. Okay. Uh, then I've got a slice at the end, so I'm getting rid of the uh, the tilde, sorry, not the tilde, the, um, the quote and the B takes that off. So I just end up with a 111 if it was free, for example. And that's my bit because I need to serialize the bits. Remember we're in Python now, not in C. So manipulate the bit manipulation isn't quite as easy. We have to jump through a few hoops. And that was the easiest way I could find of doing this particular one. There are better ways of doing it, by the way. Um, for uh, underscore zero in range eight minus len bits. So this is important here. So what I'm saying is um, what that function returns will vary in length because it won't have the preceding zeros. OK. Um, it will automatically get rid of those. But actually, I do need to write the zeros when I'm serializing this out. So um, basically, I need to first transmit a load of zeros that represent how many that is. Now, the way I calculate that is 8 minus the length of the bits, I need number of strings. Um, and then I get back number of, a zero here as this counts through, but I'm not interested in that. That's why it's, I'm using an underscore value. And um, I'm just going to uh, use the clock here. I'm going to set that high. Serialize out, put the value false because I'm sitting a zero and then true. So I, I'm outputting all the preceding zeros, the leading zeros, and then I'm outputting all of the bits in bits. So for each one that I get in the bits from this conversion value, uh, I take the clock low. If the bit is zero, I set the S out, output to false or zero. Otherwise I set it to true and then I clock up the value. So it gets latched in. So I'm basically serializing it. Um, we're then back up to having written uh, gone through each of those bytes and written them serially, we then break. Then at the end we do, so we've then transferred the entire bit image through over serial SPI. So we then need to do these dummy clocks again. And in this case, we're just sending 149 of them. And that's it. We then say, uh, finish programming, assuming we haven't had any errors with the file reads in the interim period. And that is it. Now, if I run this, this is probably, this is one of the most inefficient versions of this that I'd ever written before, but it's probably the first time I've ever written it in Python. You see, it's much quicker than this, even if you're bit banging. Um, and if I run this now, so if I save this file, it will automatically run. So if you watch what happens in the putty window, you'll see it running through. So it says it opened the file OK, and then it says it found the uh, bits, bit image, and then it goes off and it starts writing the files. Now this is going to take a long time. Um, what is interesting here is to look at what that looks like because I've got a logic analyzer connected as well. I could show you what that looks like if I do a quick capture. So 
me just bring this up for you. I do uh, hopefully I'll get some stuff on here. Right, so let me just add that to this view. And capture uh, logic. That's interesting. Ah, for some reason it doesn't show me that when I try and capture that window. It just gives me a blank. Oh, that's not very helpful. Doesn't seem to be able to capture that window. I'll show you what I mean here. Normally in OBS, when you add a window in, it will show you what's in there that with that window that you captured. But all I'm getting here is just a big blank, despite the fact that there is stuff um, readily apparent in the window itself. That's very strange. Why can't I see that on there? Oh, this is very annoying. Okay. Can I do a screen capture of that? Maybe. Let me try and snag it. Give me a sec. Uh, snip it with the sniping tool. Bear with me a second. This is an awkward way to have to do it. Uh, new. Okay. It's a very awkward way of showing this, I'm afraid. So let me get rid of this. And remove. Let's add. Yeah, I want to get rid of it. Add a snip. Window capture. Capturing a snip window. Which is kind of illogical, but there you go. But at least you'll be able to see it rather than the logic analyzer. I've never tried capturing this before, so there you go. For some reason, it doesn't like the logic analyzer. So if you look at the capture there, you can see. Um, let me just move it across a bit. On there, you can see the clock line. Um, actually, uh, this particular section is sending zeros. Bear in mind, because we're only using, only doing a blink um, piece of HDL, most of the image file is just zeros because we're not using any of the memory. We're, not, we're hardly using any lookup tables. So most of what you see in a logic analyzer is that. And that's still programming, by the way. That's been going a few minutes already. But here you can see the clock signal. But can you see how uneven the clock cycles are? Now, if you look at the way that we're programming this, um, if I can move this down a bit, then what you find is that it will correspond to this diagram when we're writing the bits. We're sp this this part where it's doing the zeros runs faster than this part. 
because there's less of an algorithm that turns into less code etc that's why you get these uneven amounts so you're looking at one byte being transferred there and some bits of that happen really fast other bits happen really slowly so these are clear signs of possibilities for optimization and the other thing uh, from an optimist optimization point of view is if we look at the interval between each clock cycle um, it's huge so let me just do a new capture So here you can see the interval. There's one byte, there's another byte, and another. look how much time there is in between sending each byte. Again, another opportunity um, to speed things up. You know, this is a combination of using Python and bit banging, um, something in just a knock together fashion. Um, it's obviously highly inefficient. Um, we're spending lots of time working around. So there's lot, it's quite interesting seeing, well, partially, how bad it actually is, just knocking something up in Python, how slow it is. If you look at the uh, timescales there, between, uh, there's about four milliseconds between each byte, which is a heck of a gap. And you think, well, what the hell is it doing? It can't be just reading a byte taking that long. Um, but it's because we are doing things individually as bytes, etc. And plus, we're, the actual writing of the byte over SPI here is actually quite slow uh, and uneven, you know. So one of the things that I then went and did was, well, how, how can we improve that? So if I now go back to that code, let's get rid of this... Um, timing diagram because we don't need that right now and let me show you how I then optimize that somewhat because that is literally still writing that code in SPI now it hasn't finished oh it's just finished now I don't know how long that was I can't remember exactly when it started but it's a good few minutes to actually program the FPGA, that's how slow it is, incredibly slow. So um, a more optimized version of that, just to show you some of the easy wins that you get. Again, still bit banging. Um, if we look at the way that we write the byte here, um, first of all, if it's zero. If the byte is zero, we can just write eight zeros. Not only that, we know that S out doesn't change, so we don't have to write to that register at all, other than at the start. And then we do three, eight quick toggles of the clock. So whenever we write a zero now, which is what we spend most of our time doing, because the bit file is mostly zeros, then it just runs this, which is much faster. Okay um and then otherwise if it's not zero uh then we still do our bit bin conversion but we know that the s out value isn't going to change so we don't have that here so if, for however many zeros we're going to leading zeros we're going to write we just toggle that because we know it's always going to be zero in this case and the only time we need to worry about it changing is on these slower ones Okay, so that's the first optimization. So that will mean that when we're writing stuff out, that's a bit more optimized. But also, let's look at the way that we're writing uh, the bytes. Let's not just do one byte at a time. Uh, I'm incrementing by 64 bytes at a time here. So I'm reading in from the file 64 bytes. This is good. So we're not having to hit that file for one byte each time, which is a lot of overhead. We're actually getting in a chunk of 64. Um, and then we're iterating over those bytes. So that big gap that we had in between the bytes where it's going off and rereading another byte from the file gets much smaller. So now if I run this, I'm assuming, I'm hoping it does run because this was a copy. Let's see. 
that's now writing. How long is that going to take? So it's a bit banging it to the FPGA now. I mean, it was a good few minutes before, so this should be better. And I'll do a capture as well while we're at it. And let me capture a bit of that. Right, that's done. So it's probably about five times faster. Don't know about four or five times faster. Um, and now we see a bit more consistency as well, I think. Yeah, so if we look at some of these byte reads now. Can you see how much quicker that these look together? Let me just, I have to snip this, which is painful. So if we now look at some of those byte reads, they are much more um, effective. So let me just show you that. Where's my snipper? Let's turn it on. So if we now look at the waveform for that, can you see how much closer they are together and how much more consistent they are? From those optimizations so we're spending a lot less time waiting about so you can see automatically yeah it's fine to just start with a python thing and then optimize down and i haven't even hit any c at this point I'm still in python so the way that you might optimize the python might be slightly different to the way that you optimize c You'll have to do more optimization because the natural tendency of Python is to do things that are easy to do and not necessarily fast and then go back and improve the speed of them. And some of it isn't as obvious as it might be in something like C because you're not at such a low level that you can see what's going on or where the time is being spent. Having that logic analyzer there is really helpful because I could see straight away where the time is wasted. And I could also see the differences between sending different parts of the byte out, how much that varies. So it, it was fairly easy for me to see where the time was being spent badly. So that's, you know, well, four or five times performance increase just by just within Python itself. Um, now, the other, the other thing that happened this week is the commit for the circuit Python for the ESP32 S2. Uh, a number of commits got made over the last week or so, last 10 days, um, including the fixing of the SPI. So the next stage for that is we can then, um, let me get rid of this tool, as we can go and have a look and see what that looks like. So I then hack together the version I had and used SPI. Now this in itself was really interesting for me because again, I'm fairly new to the circuit Python, so the way that it works isn't necessarily as intuitive as it could be. And I went through several different things. So for example, this Adafruit thing here, I, I was using to start with this library. I didn't actually need it. So I can actually do this without adding any libraries in, which is kind of cool. So I'm doing a similar thing. So if we look at this, uh, the way that we're doing things. Now, the first obvious difference between this proper SPI that's going to use the SPI library in Python, which underneath has some C, and it uses the peripheral properly. So rather than us bit banging out SPI in serial. So the only lines that we need to do in terms of serial are uh, the reset line and the um, chip select line. In Python, you control the chip select, by the way. It's not done by the library. There is a wrapper library, uh, like the Adafruit one I showed you at the top that's commented out that can take that. So we only need two of those. So I've 
commented out the old ones because I don't need them as SP as uh, GPIOs anymore because I'm going to pass those in to uh, a, a driver that does the SPI. I'm still doing the same sort of thing, setting these values up, getting it ready to start. Uh, and resetting the ice, etc. Observing the same things, but I'm not doing the dummy clocks here. The dummy clocks was a bit tricky because I'm asking it to do something that's slightly strange. Because I'm effectively asking it to do an SPI transaction where the uh, chip select is true rather than low. But anyhow, so when I go into my actual writing, uh, so I create an SPI circuit circuit Python abstraction here. Which is part of bus IO. Now bus IO covers I squared C and SBI, by the way. Um, so what I'm passing in effectively to this construction, SPI construction, is the same IO pins that I would have bit banked above. Clock, uh, serial out, serial in. So I've then got an SPI device. Uh, something else that I have to do here because I'm going to manipulate the way that the SPI bus is working. Um, I'm going to set things like the clock rate, phase, and polarity. Or oh, certainly in this version, when I was experimenting, I would be able to do that. In order to do that, I have to get a lock on the SPI thing to make sure something else isn't trying to use it whilst I'm doing this. Okay, uh, so it just checks that it can get a lock on that then I go and configure the SPI um, just using a phase zero and a polarity zero and in this case I'm setting it to be five megahertz which is going to be significantly faster than what I was bit banging uh, as you can imagine but that should be all right over the kind of loose header pins that I'm using um, I'm going to set the value true for the SSL value I'm going to write out eight clock cycles, but I'm going to use SPI to do that. So I'm cheating. So I'm just writing a zero byte out, which is eight ones. Sorry, eight zeros. Then I'm going to take that false again. So this is where it's a bit weird. Um, I'm doing the opposite thing to what you'd normally do in a spy write. You'd normally be bringing the select value down low. It's an active low. But because this is a prelude to getting the ICE 40 ready, uh, I then do all the normal stuff here, right up until the point, you know, where I get the signature in the file, and then I do my write bytes. And this is rewritten now to use the SPI peripheral. So in the uh, write bytes, um, I'm again taking a 64 byte chunk out of the file, and I'm breaking that down. And what I'm doing here is I'm then setting the value to false because it's active low chip select and then writing out those bytes and i'll show you that in a minute and then bringing it back up so if we look at the spi write bytes in this case this has changed obviously from what it was before we're not bit banging it anymore we're using the peripheral directly using the SPI peripheral. I don't know why I was looking for the library function here. It's, it's not in my file. Um, so I'm literally just passing the bytes into the SPI function rather than bit banging it now. And then the rest of it works in exactly the same way until we get to the end where again I do the funky bit here. And rather than writing 149 zeros out bit by bit, I'm calling 19 SPI writes with zero, which is equivalent roughly. Um, and I'm again, it's inverted logic, so I'm actually using VSS high and then setting the value to false afterwards. So now, if I run this, That's it, it's done. It's that quick. It's entirely different. Uh, let me go and get you a capture. I can show you the entire thing and you, you'll see that it doesn't actually take very long on the logic analyzer.
as you can see the entire thing only takes so when do we start about two and a half seconds and then it ends up like nine seconds so it's taking us about seven seconds using the SPI peripheral <laughs> a world of difference as you you can imagine when you actually use the SPI peripheral um, much faster not only that if you go and look in at some of this it's uh, much healthier type waveforms you can see the clock is running at a uh, much higher speed and you're not seeing all those silly gaps everywhere seeing some good data transfer let me just show you a quick uh, sample of that damn it I wish this logic analyzer would show there you go Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't capture anything. There we go. So you're seeing a lot less gaps in there. The data is being transmitted most of the time. So it's actually spending its time doing what it should do. So that's quite interesting. Um, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Um, I just thought it's a useful thing to go through from the point of view of writing circuit Python and the process of optimization through that. Slightly different than how you do it in C. Some would say more time consuming. Well, yeah, it's quite simple. If we're doing something more complex, it might be a quick way of iterating in order to get there. So uh, the next thing what I, I'd like to do is just we switch back now so you can actually see I can I get rid of some of this let's get rid of some of this now move this out of the way let's just take this down we don't need that and uh, we might need that browser let's keep that keep the editor okay let's just put the editor to one side for a sec we know what's there okay so if you remember what we've got going on underneath here we've got the uh, um, Kaluga one board on the right programming the lattice and the flashing LED here is the blinky that's running so if I run that again just by saving the file you'll see goes out very briefly and then starts again very quick so the next thing to do then is well let's apply this to our recall puppy board so I'm going to unplug the uh, cumbersome development system push that to one side and now we have the massive board here look so now we have alloy uh, it's kind of upside down to the way that the CAD was by the way but it fits so what I'm going to do here is eject circuit pi I don't know if you'll be able to hear this. I haven't got the um, sound on there. Voila. So there's our board. We've got our LED status light there. Okay. And it's come up with CircuitPython here. 
So we've got that same same value. Just open that file. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that now. And we need to be watching up here. So let me just actually, because Putty's going to be a little bit upset right now because I've just disconnected the older one. Let me see. And save. Yeah, it's not happy about that. Let me restart Putty. Let's just check my device manager. Okay, this comes up as COM twelve. Do, 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 do. So let me go back to where's Putty? I've lost my Putty. Let's just run it again. So I need to connect to COM twelve. Hmm. Okay, so I'm running the file and it's output and it's programming. And you can see that down there, the LED. So this has programmed this and you've got the LED. And just to prove you, so let me just show you the other side of that if I can. Uh, 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 let me find right where would this be? Here we go. So let me add. I wonder if this will add the right file back. So if I show you the editor now, I'm going to need to. select slightly different what's it called link here we go So we're now looking at the file that I've edited. Oh, let me just move some things around here. I've got a bit less room. Sorry if it's a bit small, guys. So this is the Verilog that I've written called Blink, which takes a clock coming in, takes an output LED IO, creates a register in this case it's a 16-bit or 17-bit register and then all it does is it simply um, attaches the LED output so this is asynchronous Verilog to bit 16 the uppermost bit of that count register and then always so on every clock cycle what it does is it increments the counter register register by one outputs so when that final bit flips over after two to the 16 clocks the LED will toggle very simple okay and that's what I'm running so I can actually run that on a different LED so if I look at the other file here it controls that um, if I go to the chip one
the LED that I pass in here is LED one. So if I make that LED zero, because there's three LEDs connected to this particular FPGA, and I save that, I can then go into um, a PowerShell and run the um, the tool chain. Bear with me. Again, this might be a bit small. I do apologize in advance. Uh, uh, where did I put this? Where did I put this? FPGA tools. Tools. Uh, examples. Alloy. And I blink, I just show you what's in that folder here. And then what I could do, I've got these back in my past. So the first thing I do is I run Yosis on that chip.v, which also calls in blink.v. Then I run a rack, next PNR on that. Ooh. Yeah, so from the output from Yosis, which is in JSON format, and then kind of a, a it's also bringing in the blink.pcf file. The blink.pcf file in this case is a um, uh, is just the pin configuration that tells me where the clock and the LED pins are. I do that. Next PR runs, and you get some statistics. I can then pack all that up. Into blinky.bing, and then I can copy it across onto D drive, which is the mounted uh, flash, if you like, on this board. Flash ROM. Uh, CP blinky.bin, and I'm going to call it logic.bin. Remember, I used the logic.bin name. Now, as soon as I do that, you should see the LED go off on the board the flashing one as it gets reprogrammed and then you should see a different color LED come on and start flashing because we just changed that yeah the LEDs off and there we go flashing I didn't change it though what didn't I change did I not save that let's try a different one Two. Save. Just going to repeat the exercise. I'm not sure that I actually changed what was already on there. Normally, you just run a make file to do all this, but because I've just got these tools thrown on here in Windows, this is just an easier way of doing it. Let's do it again. That is a different LED, it's funny. So it's going between the orange and the um, red. I think there's a green one on there. Oh, unless I put two orange ones on the board. It's entirely possible. Let me just try one more thing. Hold on. Done LED. What was that one? Start with an LED. Not. Okay. Oh, it's because I've not. Ah. Right, so if I go zero here, I need to set the others to off. That's why it's not working. Silly me. Are you back, Sparkles? I'm just in the middle of my streaming. Yeah. I'm not mad. I don't talk to my cats. Um... Copy. Let's see if this uses a different LED. Oh, that's so annoying. What's different here? What am I doing differently? One, two, so I have it to two. And I'll make this. If I do one, zero, and one, I'll make this two. 
save it. I'm saving the right file, aren't I? No. Make sure I'm in the right directory, of course. Always happens when you want to try and demonstrate something. Guaranteed. Yes, that's a different one. That's the orange one. Right, cool. So we can see it is Woiken. Marvellous. So rather than having to have that big dev set up now, I can, for the rest of my part, parts of this development, I can just use the, uh, the Ally board. And this shows me a whole bunch of things. First of all, the Flash is working. Circuit Python's working. It's running stuff. And my code using the SPI library in CircuitPython is now reprogramming the lattice chip. Uh, the only thing that's slightly different here between this and the development version is I'm using a 16-bit divider. On the um, Kaluga 1, I'm using a 24-bit register doing the countdown to divide because I'm actually using a proper 12 megahertz clock. As a clock source on the lattice breakout board on here i don't yet have the clock being generated automatically which should be i think i was going to use a 24 megahertz one i haven't done the circuit python code that generates that what you can do is you can there's a peripheral inside the chip just like on the stm32 that enable you to divide the clock down the internal clock down and output it on a pin um, now that happens to be one of the pins that's messed up on this board so what I've done is I've used a different pin and then I've used a GPIO so on this particular code what I'm doing is I'm bit banging a clock so it's a lot slower that's why my divide is lower so let me just show you that uh, so it's slightly different Yes, Sparkle, hold on one second. Hold on one cotton picking second. I can't find which file it is. I've got too many open sparks. Sublime. Mm. D, D, D. Should be called D. I can't see it. Here we go. So on here, you see, after I bit banged it out, I then run this forever, which basically flips a pin that I call clock, which provides a clock input to the FPGA. But that's obviously running a lot less than 12 megahertz, considerably less because it's just a bit bang clock because I needed a clock input. Ta da! Have you gone? What are you doing? Can you go out? I'm going to go in the house. Oh. Don't just stand there. Get your tail chopped off. It's already shorter than it should be. Okay. So. Overall, it's been great progress. Um, this week. And I can now move away from using the dev boards. And actually use the alloy board. So most of it's working. I've got to make a few changes. As I found out, so for example, the um, the done pin, I've got to reroute that on the next iteration, so it's rerouted to the BQS pin. Um, what I might do on this board is um, lift the ice forty and then reseat it again, put some more flux on there. Maybe get those other pins back. That will help a lot. Um, however, it's going to take quite a while to work out how to exchange information with the ICE 40 on the higher bit widths. So initially, I'll write some Verilog probably um, that will just support the normal SPI, the one bit duplex SPI. Uh, serial in serial out get that working inside the FPGA build a kind of prototype 
library for CircuitPython for that. And then maybe start playing around with some of the models. Um, and then I haven't used it here, but start doing some stuff in MyGen. I need to also write the MyGen uh, board driver file as well for this. That should be relatively straightforward as well. And then start getting the two talking together so that we're programming both from Python. I've also got a bunch of other hardware tests that I need to run on here. Maybe do some tests using the SPI Flash, see how that's working as well on the ESP. Test some of the ADCs and other bits and bobs. There's a lot of things on there that I still need to test. And I'm not even talking about doing any of the Wi-Fi stuff at this point. But I've um, got some tests to do on that as well. But the good news is we're up and running. Uh, Alloy's working. I've got my von Neumann working with CircuitPython. And I've got the Lattice Ice 40 working with HGL, at least from a very long point of view. Uh, next step is to get the NMIGEN stuff and get some of these devices checked out. Um, and think about optimizing the board layout wise, etc. But the, the theory is proven it's fine. The other thing that's missing on here is the charging parts of it. I've got the chips and stuff installed, but I didn't have at the time of constructing this the JST 2mm battery connector. I've now got a couple of those here, um, which strangely enough, mouse also sell. So when I ordered the um, um, the new flash chips I ordered a couple of these as well the only ones they sell are ones supplied by guess who Adafruit strangely enough so I can try putting that on try doing some battery charging as well but I'm going to have to dig through my stuff to find some appropriately sized lithium ion rechargeable batteries I do have some somewhere in one of my many many boxes um, thanks Ed uh, glad you got a chance to pop by. Um, so that concludes this really for the moment. If there's any questions, please fire them away now. Um, but the status is good. Uh, well, at the start of the week was a bit of a pain, particularly with the flash issues and that. It's kind of come good at the end of the week, which is nice. Um, but this is what... Uh, electronics is like you know um, you add in software to the electronics parts and there's all sorts of places things can go wrong um, this is why we do prototypes because it's never right first time um, so we're looking good my next stream will be on Wednesday next week i do hope to succeed on getting it out on a wednesday rather than a friday um please check out the forum um let me give you that address let me check that as well so i didn't spell it wrong which i've done in the past Actually, http s so if you want to talk, uh, do pop down to the forum, register. There's some very interesting people that hang out down there. There's all the other stuff about the other um, MyStorm products as well. Uh, and you can fire away and ask me any questions or discuss anything here or is anything you're interested in seeing. Um, do let me know. Um, also, if you get a chance, please do follow me on Twitch. That helps. The more followers I get, the more they, I get to keep my streams on Twitch. Uh, what I normally do is I republish these on YouTube later um, after I finish, but it's, it's a bit of a pain, a bit of a manual process. But I will get there. So, um, let me just switch back to the regular view here. So if there's no further questions, I, I just noticed that Ed's actually gone now. Um, 
do fire away either on the forum please do follow me on twitch if you get a chance um and let me know is this the right sort of format have i covered the right sort of areas might have been a bit too in depth i don't know for some people maybe not for others tell me i can adapt the format so that you know we cover all of our bases um some of it can go quite deep some of it's going to be higher higher level etc depending on what people want to see uh i can go as deep or as high as we need to appropriately so in the meantime listen have a good weekend guys no, it's my evening here it's about 10 30 ish no quarter past 10 no 10 30. so i've been going about two and a half hours um so i'm now gonna switch off for a bit and relax a bit over the weekend or i do have some stuff to do here as well as my social stuff so thank you for coming along uh, I appreciate your time. Please leave me some feedback at some point. And I look forward to um, seeing everyone and maybe some other people as well, some other new people um, next Wednesday. Ciao.